All right, the next set of questions related to localization in neurology that I got from the live session for neurology rotation in family practice specialty rotations by Apna Merit uh, is questions related to upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron. So let's start with very basics. The questions are, kindly, can you elaborate upper and lower motor neuron lesions and signs? And I, I'm confused. Can you please repeat if possible upper motor versus lower motor neuron lesions? Um, so let's uh, let's look at motor control let's say that i moved uh, a muscle you know let's say i moved my thumb and let's say that i used one muscle to move it now what has to happen for me to be able to move the thumb the muscle that moves the thumb needs to contract it will contract because of the electrical signal in the muscle itself that electrical signal is coming from the nerve through a nerve muscle junction. So that junction has to work. Then the nerve has to carry the signal down into the muscles for it to contract. And then the nerve uh, is, is starting from the spinal cord where the start of the nerve or the nerve body is located. So when a nerve body activates, it sends down a signal and that comes all the way down to the nerve muscle junction uh, running along the axon and then crosses it over into muscle to create an electric D um, what was the word uh, voltage potential between the nerve depolarization of the muscle uh, membrane and causes uh, electrical signal that releases uh, calcium opens up calcium channels and inputs the calcium and that calcium activates the actin and myosin uh, um, uh, proteins that causes walking of the muscle uh, fibers the h and z bands and causes contraction of the muscle and then the calcium is found packed out and the muscle relax uh, once the signal is gone the process is really quick right very sharply happening but that basically is the control of a muscle now that can part of the control the cell body sending out a signal going all the way down in through the nerve into the muscle through the junction is what is called a lower motor nerve neuron or lower motor neuron system that is controlling the muscle. Any damage in this will be a lower motor neuron type of damage, uh, which is starting from the muscle body all the way down into the muscle. Now, uh, typically, the neuromuscular junction disorders are considered separate. So basically, it's the nerve body, the nerve root, the nerve plexus, and the nerve itself, which is the lower motor neuron type of a, of a lesion. Now, neuromuscular junction is considered separate, and then the muscle disorder itself, where it cannot contract anymore, is considered separately. So there's myopathy, there's neuromuscular junction disorder, and then there is the lower motor neuron disorders, which can include neuropathy, plexopathy, radiculopathy, which is the root, plexus, and nerve, and then the spinal cord disease itself can damage the cell body, which is sitting over there which is the myelitis or, or myelopathy or something like that. That's the lower motor neuron part. Now, what is the upper motor neuron part? The, and the, let's think about it. What is the need for something more than that? And the need is that you don't want your thumb to contract all the time, right? So there is a certain time when you want your muscles to contract. So one, some, 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 some thought has to generate, okay, I need to move the muscle. Two, a plan has to be created. Maybe it's not just moving the muscle. Maybe it's moving muscle and finger or muscle in this finger, muscle in this finger. Each movement will require a different plan. That plan, when it's generated, needs to come down to those neurons that are controlling these muscles, the lower motor neurons. Um, so that complex system that starts from the top of the brain, going down all the way into the spine where the control of these muscles are, is the upper motor neuron. So lower motor neuron is kind of the worker which will get the work done. You know, if you think about, let's say, uh, building a wall, it's that labor, lower motor neuron is a labor that sits down and puts the bricks and builds a wall. While the upper motor neuron is kind of the house owner or architect who comes and says, oh, I need a wall this high and this wide and this long and this kind of brick and this and that. And it gives the requirement and then the labor gets the work done. That's the upper motor neuron. So now, you know, you understand the, the, the distinction with the lower motor neuron starts right where the neuron body is and downstream there until the junction of the nerve and muscle. And upper motor neuron is all the pathway above it. And there may be, there are, you know, many neurons in that pathway, but where the thought was generated to where the signal reached the lower motor neuron, all of that is the upper motor neuron. So that, that's the separation. Now, why? 
why do we keep on hounding about upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron and blah 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 if you think about it these are still large categories lower motor neuron has spinal cord has the nerve roots dorsal root anterior root dorsal root ganglia has the junction or pedicle radicle formation then the plexus uh and then the multiple par- arms of the plexus and the nerves and then multiple nerves going all the way to the nerve junction and similarly upper motor neuron has many parts the rest of the spinal cord where uh, above the let lower motor neuron it is the uh, brain stem the brain the cortex itself the deep part of the brain internal capsule the surface of the brain and then there is the uh, you know motor cortex and premotor cortex and things like that so i- in some sense uh, it is a very simplified separation of the system into two groups the system actually is very complex has had you know 10 different players involved each one can get sick and can be the cause of the disease but we're just dividing them into two groups group a and group b and the group a is upper motor neuron and group b is lower motor neuron uh i would say for two reasons uh that we do it the first reason i believe to understand is the historical reason that the neurology started 150 200 years ago when there was nothing there was no x-rays there was no cat scans there was no mris there was no emgs nerve conduction study we didn't even knew how the nerve conducts we we had no idea we probably didn't even know about the nerves or spinal cord pathways we didn't even, but what we did understand was that certain patients behave in a certain way and usually we end up finding damage in the uh in the brain somewhere or upper part of spinal cord and certain patients behaved the other way where we ended up finding the damage in the lower part of spinal cord or nerve root or the nerves themselves all the way down into the muscle and the smart physicians back then most of them were primary care physicians then neurologists as a field came very late um started looking at their patients after they've died and trying to match with how they were presenting and they were divided them into these two groups the upper motor neuron and the lower motor neuron and with that context the second thing makes more sense that there are clear differences between how group a upper motor presents against group b lower motor it with a little bit of practice you can start picking them up very easily you can easily tell okay this is from group a this is from group b very 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 simple thing to do you can teach it to medical students uh, you can teach it to technicians you know you know you're uh, someone in your clinic uh, who's helping you make documentation it's such a simple thing to teach and it has a huge implication half of the problems are already out if you say it's group a you don't have to worry about group b everything related to group b is out everything related to lower motor neuron is out all test all management all treatment all evaluations and if you say it's a group a it's group b not group a then everything related to group a is out you don't have to worry about it so it's a very quick way of removing 50% of the diseases and focusing on a certain area and and easy to train and very clearly different from each other without too much of a overlap or doubt and that's why we keep on hounding about upper motor neuron versus lower motor neuron right now what is it why why you know, what are those simple things that can tell you okay this is upper motor neuron versus this lower motor neuron and there are few very very simple things that all have their explanation in pathophysiology but let's look at them and i'll try to remember them as quickly as i can uh let's talk about the muscle themselves if the muscle is weak basically you cannot move the muscle what is the resting state of the muscle if the lower motor neuron is damaged spine lower, lower spinal cord onwards nerve root nerve then the muscle is loose what we call flaccid you know you can easily move the muscles there is no problem there if the upper motor neuron is damaged then the muscles is usually more tight you know it because the lower motor neuron still exist and now what it does is that it provides a slow constant activation because it doesn't know when to activate this that orders are gone so it has to decide on its own and it decide to just fire all the time constantly so the muscle itself is loose or tight that's one thing number two is the responsiveness of the muscle what we call reflexes you know if you tap or jerk what happens to it in the lower motor type of neuron those reflexes go down they don't react very well to that stimulation that you do with stretching the tendon but in the upper motor neuron the reflexes are overactive they quickly react because the lower motor neuron is there is sitting wanting to work 
it just doesn't have any information from the top when to work. So it is overly sensitive to peripheral information. If it gets a signal because of the stretch of a muscle coming in, you tap the tendon, it thought, oh, I, I've been told to, to contract, to work. And it certainly contracts and you get a jerk. So there is a hyperreflexia when the lower motor neuron exists, the lower motor neuron system exists. While upper is gone, there are no orders when to work. While it is absent when lower, you know, there's nobody to react. The lower motor neuron is gone. So then there is a loss of reflexes. One specific reflex that we often use a lot uh, in differentiating between upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron is what is called Babinski reflex, which is the scratching the bottom of the foot. Now, I think it's made overly famous by Dr. Babinski, Joseph Babinski, because it was probably one of the earliest sign that he picked up that he could use easily to tell someone is having stroke or not having a stroke, right? So the lower motor neuron will be nerve damage, which is the most common cause, and upper motor neuron is stroke, which is the most common cause. So he could round, you know, the story goes that he will round in these large wards like the Mayo Clinic has, you know, 60 patients in a, in a ward, a big hall. And as he walked by, he could be just touching, you know, with his finger as he's walking along the foot uh, of the patients, uh, and he could tell stroke, not stroke, not stroke, stroke, not stroke. I'm probably exaggerating it. Probably other people have, but it was that magical, right? You could walk around the ward and immediately separate the patients. Okay, these seven have stroke, all the 30 other don't have stroke. All of them are coming with weakness or something. You know, he was a neurologist, so he was running uh, a neurology ward. So that's how magical it was. But the, but the concept, you know, another interesting thing about Babinski reflex is that it's the bottom most reflex possible. The, you know, the bottom of the foot, that's the end of the patient. You know, start from the head all the way down. That's the low, farthest away thing from the top of the brain, from the brain control. So, you know, that one reflex is testing everything uh, above it. So that's another interesting thing about Babinski. And third is that it's very easy to learn and do, although there is some learning involved, you know, just scratching the foot is not Babinski reflex. It has to be in a special way, in a special pressure and things like that. And then fourth, it's easily obvious, very uncommon to not have a clear response from Babinski reflex, although it can happen, but it's far less common than what the res residents and, and medical students will tell you. They would often come back, oh, Babinski reflex, I couldn't tell. You, you know, they didn't do it right or, or they didn't do it enough or something like that. So those are the few I just highlighted. There are probably a couple of more, but I don't want to go into too many details. I think the concept should be clear. Let's see if there's any other question left related to it. So... Um, how to go for differential in patient with absent reflexes and upgoing plantar. Now, see, there are two different things happening. Absent reflexes we just talked about is the lower motor neuron. Upgoing plantar is the upper motor neuron. Now, there are some strange scenarios I can build to explain this. Uh, and strange things can happen. You know, patient is patient. They haven't read the textbook and there's so many variations possible. But in general, in general, if I'm seeing an old person especially old person, or, or, you know, let's say any person, and there is a clear Babinski reflex that he has an upper motor neuron sign, but the reflexes are absent, then there are one most common possibility that comes to my mind is that he has a combination of lower motor neuron and upper motor neuron lesion. So it may be the patient has a stroke, but the reflexes is absent at the ankle because of also having neuropathy. That he's a diabetic who was neuropathic, had lost re ankle reflexes months ago, years ago, and is now coming up with an acute stroke because diabetes is also a risk factor for stroke. So it's a combination of neuropathy, which is the diabetic neuropathy causing loss of ankle reflexes, plus stroke causing upper motor neuron, the Babinski reflex. Now there are many other scenarios I can go into details, but you know, bottom line is that if you just remember this, that there may be a combination. Don't ignore what you're seeing and, and try to find a good explanation for it. Um, and then the question is that how to manage at GP or general practitioner level weakness in lower motor neuron lesion. So uh, lower motor neuron lesion means that the damage could be either in the spinal cord at lower motor neuron level or in the nerve root or in the nerve itself. And you need an evaluation for that to see where the lesion is. For that, you have imaging and you have the nerve conduction studies. Uh, and then you have to figure out a cause for it. So let's say the lesion is in the spinal cord, then you have to do workup to find cause for spinal cord lesions. Um, imaging may give you the answer, or if not, then you have to do a spinal fluid level, a CSF, spinal fluid test and a CSF analysis. If it's in the nerve, then you have to do workup for neuropathies, you know, autoimmune, environment deficiencies, and so on and so forth. Some of it you could do easily yourself. 
uh, and you know depending on your comfort level and then others you have to send to a neurologist so the question again uh, is that can we clinically differentiate between Guillain-Barre syndrome and transverse myelitis and the answer should be obvious by now Guillain-Barre syndrome is a neuropathy it's an acute inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy but bottom line is it's a neuropathy and the myelitis is a spinal cord disease which has a mixture of upper and lower motor picture right the spinal cord disease will affect some lower motor neuron that exists there but also will affect the con the connection between the brain and the everything below it uh, below that lesion the, if the lesion is cervical cord then everything below will have a upper motor kind of a problem the the command is gone and anything everything around that lesion will have a lower motor kind of a problem so you will have a mix of that and you, you should be able to tell it uh, based on that although you know at times it's challenging and let's not go into those details and then uh, last question is that can you put a light on patient with transverse myelitis young male with urinary incontinence and weakness of limbs uh, i think the answer is pretty straightforward the weakness of limbs is explainable because of the transverse myelitis the weakness could be lower motor type uh, let's say in the arms and hands because of it's let's say it's a cervical myelitis but it will be upper motor neuron type in the legs uh, because of disconnecting the brain with the rest of the spinal cord uh, the urinary bladder control is also easily explainable the control of the bladder contraction of the bladder just is a lower motor neuron phenomena it has a micturition center in the lumbar spinal cord so spinal cord tells the bladder okay open up but when to open up is controlled by the brain. So that's the upper motor neuron type of the ur ur urination. Now when the upper motor neuron connection is gone, let's say it's a cervical or thoracic myelitis, then now the lower motor neuron of the bladder in the spine maturation center it does not have any commands from the brain. So what it does is that it responds to the peripheral stimulation. Just like we talked about reflexes being becoming hyperreflexic, the bladder becomes hyperreflexic. So anytime it gets a signal, and the signal to the bladder usually is a stretching of the bladder. So bladder starts getting urine, is doing nothing, doing nothing, doing nothing. The bladder keeps on growing, 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 growing. You you, you know you want to pee, you, want, you try and nothing's happening until the bladder is stretched enough that that creates a, ref a signal back to the lower motor neuron control of the bladder and you, you suddenly have a reflex micturation. So uh, that, uh, a, you know, will be the picture of uh, incontinence in, in that uh, patient. Good.